Awesome. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Cassandra lunch number 41. I can't believe we're almost to uh, one year of doing this. Um, you know, we didn't know when, like literally almost one year ago, uh, last week, um, when the shutdown happened, how it would affect us. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, a year later, we're still in <laughs> remote Coronaville. Um, today's topic is actually a follow on of something we've talked about before, which is Cassandra on Kubernetes. And in the past, uh, we've talked conceptually about it, kind of what are the operators out there? Um, you know, what are the different ways to, to use uh, Cassandra and Kubernetes? But, um, you know, as I'm um, digging deeper into this myself for some of the work that I'm doing and some of the work our team's doing, um, I, I realized that I should just document it, uh, you know, and, and, and actually just give these presentations so we can record it and it, it'll be beneficial for people in general. Um, so the audience for this is basically anybody that doesn't know this stuff, right? It's not like you should be already a Docker expert or Kubernetes expert. Um, do hope that you know a little bit about Cassandra, but that's okay. Um, I am your organizer. Uh, I think Arpen, I'm gonna kind of prescript you to uh, <laughs> to help run this because you did such a great job of writing that uh, that script for the last time. So um, look forward to seeing your face on your your mugshot on here next week, right? Um, what do we do as organizers? We get people, we promote this. Um, we actually have a, a couple of uh, other uh, meetups. One is uh, Mondays, um, and so there's a little bit of cross-pollination. But uh, if you're interested in speaking on a topic, um, you know, let let me know. Just just ping me, um, and that includes anybody. It really is. You don't have to be like a super expert. This is a meetup. The whole point of a meetup is for you to not only learn something but also um, hone your public speaking skills and presentation skills because, hey, this is how we work now. Data Community DC believes um, in, you know, in diverse communities. We are part of a Data Community DC, which is a nonprofit foundation. Um, you know, at least this, this meetup is. Um, we are one of many. Um, we're not officially in Data Community DC, um, but we are generally like a, a, an offshoot of Data Wranglers. And then starting uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I'm gonna put us into the actual data community DC site. And uh, the reason we haven't done that yet is because we wanted to build a, a loyal following and get a kind of attraction of about a year of published uh, videos before we did that. Uh, what do we cover here? Uh, we cover anything related to Cassandra protocol. So Datastax is one, uh, commercial variant of, of open source Apache Cassandra, um, managed key spaces for Cassandra is an AWS product built with different technology, but it's still Cassandra compliant. Cosmos DB is Cassandra compliant. And so are C++ built Yugabyte and uh, Scala DB. And all of them have the same concept of, you know, key spaces, tables, partitions, and rows, and they all use CQL. Um, and some of them even are wire compatible with, with the GMX node tool commands. So um, we have somebody actually in the queue to maybe give us a demo of Scala DB in the, in the near future. Uh, we see one new person. So actually two, three. All right. So, so Mark, I know you said a quick hi earlier, but uh, usually if you're new, you get to talk a little bit about yourself and what you're trying to learn. And then after Mark, it'll be Stefan and then Josh. Yeah, so go ahead. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mark Sai. I'm currently living in New York and working with uh, David and I at Kepler. Um, I'm here to just broaden my horizons a little bit. I've taken the data stack certifications and gone through that coursework, but I'm still rather new to the space. And this is as good a place to learn as any is from what I've been told. So that's why I'm here. And thank you for having me. Great. Welcome. Um, Stefan. Hi, uh, I'm Stefan. Uh, can you guys hear me? 
Yep. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'm uh, fairly new here. Um, I just started uh, the data stacks like a week ago. Uh, I'm still going through it and I think it's pretty fun. You know, I can't wait to learn all the stuff about it. Awesome. Uh, and Josh? Yeah, hey guys, uh, Josh Barnes here. I just started with a Nant. Um, also fairly new to Cassandra and um, DataStax Enterprise. Um, I like that it's uh, the CQL language is so similar to the, the SQL language. Um, and I'm excited to learn more. Great, awesome. Uh, group rules, um, if you have a question, just ask it in chat or you know, uh, unmute yourself and ask it. Um, as long as you're polite, it's also an opportunity for you to expand on what, what let's say a speaker is talking about today, it's me. Um, uh, we at Anant, uh, we help uh, our clients build platforms that are global scale, that run the world. Um, we specialize on technologies around Spark, Sander, Kafka, and uh, these days, all of that on top of the DevOps toolkit, like what we're going to talk about today, Kubernetes and, and Terraform and Ansible. Uh, one of the sponsors of this group is DataStax, uh, and uh, they're also a partner with us, with our company. Uh, GW University is a great partner with uh, all of Data Science DC, and they've been giving us venue space since ever I can remember, um, and hope after the world opens up that they will continue doing that. We have some local sponsors um, and we have institutional sponsors at Data Community DC who help fund uh, initiatives such as Data Week DC, um, boot camps on the weekends, um, great organization. So thanks everybody here on this logo, uh, logo deck for supporting us. Um, does anybody have any announcements anything coming up that they would like to talk about. Um, so I was out sick half of last week and uh, I was supposed to give a talk on migrating to the cloud from on-premise with DataStax on their workshops. Um, that will be postponed by two weeks. Um, so I will let you guys know next week. Um, but basically it's, you know, if you have a DSC or Cassandra cluster on-premise, what are the avenues of going to the cloud, going to the public cloud, and uh, you know, covering a, a variety of options such as you know Astra versus uh, DSC or Cassandra on on the cloud. And uh, if you want to catch up uh, to the last forty, well, we don't really have forty videos online for Cassandra Lunch. We have like more like thirty. Uh, a lot of this stuff is on on YouTube, so just look for Cassandra Lunch. Um, and then Cassandra Link is our knowledge base on all things Cassandra and all things related to Cassandra. And I can tell you definitively that it's the best knowledge base on Apache Cassandra outside of data stacks. And because it covers other technologies like Scylla and Yucabyte, it's I think better than that. I to say myself. All right. Um, so, you know, just to kind of give you a preview of what we've covered so you can catch up on YouTube if you're new, um, at least starting from Cassandra 10, which was talking about Cassandra 4.0. Um, you know, we have talked about different things like use cases. We talked about how to connect to uh, Kafka. We talked about um, read write path. Uh, recently, we spoke about, um, let's see, I believe, uh, Skill Migrator, um, which is a tool that's, you know, built for Scylla migrating from Cassandra, but it actually really works well with moving information between clusters or even key spaces uh, uh, from, um, from Spark, uh, with Spark, from, so Cassandra to Cassandra. Um, and uh, I had mistakenly put this as 44. Anyways, um, just as a quick uh, um, survey, um, who here has used Docker or Kubernetes? Actually, we'll start with that. Who here has used Docker? You can just either unmute yourself or just use the raise hand function and say, hey, I've used it. Okay, got one. I have used. Okay, cool. Two. All right. Three. 
Okay. I think if I know correctly, about half the group has definitely used uh, Docker. Okay. All right. Um, okay. How about people who have used Kubernetes? Okay, I know Ion has. JB, you should you should raise your hand because <laughs> you wrote a document. Kubernetes are not worked extensively. Little yeah. bit, I hope. A little bit, okay. All right, Nikita. All right, cool, Nikita. I did not know you were doing Kubernetes. That is super cool. <laughs> it was just a little thing as part of like a data stacks ran a workshop from last summer. Oh, like a Katakota probably, okay. Um, all right, looks like Josh has used it a little bit as well. Okay, cool, awesome, very cool. And, and lastly, Helm. Has anybody here used Helm? All right, um, uh, Helm Ion has used it. Okay, awesome. Um, well, great, that's a good uh, starting point for me. Um, so I know kind of what to cover and how, how deep to go in and how much we may have to spend more time on some things in, in later sessions. Um, so, oops, zoom in here a little bit. Um, before we, we do Cassandra and Kubernetes, basically we have to understand containers and uh, containers are not that new. Uh, containers have been around for a long time. Uh, they've been around for, in, in different technologies, they've been around, uh, they're called different things, but they've been around for a long time. Um, there were uh, variants or rather parent, parents of containers, such as Meso is kind of, is the, the granddaddy of containerization from what we know it. Um, but even before that in Linux, we had a concept called Linux jail, where um, a user could log in and kind of have their own approximation of the full, um, Linux file system where they could run their own services uh, without impacting other users. So their own instance of HTTP uh, and that was used commonly for virtual hosting, right? Meaning having multiple um, customers that, that ran their, uh, you know, web servers uh, and, and whatnot inside um, their jails. Um, it was used in, in university or educational environments to give users their own kind of place to install tools. Um, so the idea of containerization has been around for a long time. Um, what most people ask is, you know, how is Docker different than virtual machine? Generally, that's the first question that comes when I say, hey, containerization via Docker is going to save a lot of hardware. It's like, well, how is it different than VM? Why can't we just do VMs? You know, why not just use the VMs on the public cloud, All right? Um, well, the big, big reason is that, um, and we'll come back to, um, I think I had a picture of it, but um, here, I'll, I'll find an image of it right now. And, and the major, major difference is that, uh, here we go. Right, actually, I'll let this one. This is from docker.com. Um, And what I love about Confluence is I can just paste it in here and we'll have it for perpetuity. So the major difference between containers and VMs is that in a virtual machine, what's happening is you have hardware. What we, when we say infrastructure, basically the first level of infrastructure is hardware. And then on that infrastructure uh, with virtual machines, and I'm not talking about like when you run open you know, whatever virtual box, that's not what I'm talking about. Like I'm talking about um, like Windows Hyper-V, right? Or VMware uh, or XEN, you know? These are hypervisors that basically segment uh, the infrastructure into kind of like uh, logical partitions of the hardware, which then on top of you can run, let's say Windows on this one and, and Linux on this one and, if you want, you know, you can even run Mac uh, OS X on this one. If I think people do that sometimes, uh, but at the end of the day, that's what a virtual machine setup is like. So if you notice, there's a bit of bloat here, right? Just to run this app, you have to have this much. You have to have a full operating system with all of the libraries in. And if you were running all of these as Linux, you're basically repeating this, right? 
With a containerized system, you have the infrastructure, you have a basic host operating system, and there's actually even uh, very, very lightweight operating systems just for running containers. Like literally they have nothing in there except for the core kernel for Linux. And then you, you kind of, you know, you install what you need to on top of that. Um, but on top of that, we use something called, in this case, this is an explanation of Docker, but there are now container runtimes. And uh, the container runtimes uh, can be made by different people now because the, the image specification to run this container is it's an open uh, standard. It's, it's called the OCI standard. And people can write, they can create these, these uh, OCI standard images um, with different tools. You don't have to use Docker. Docker just happens to be the easiest one, the most widely known one. And I mean, unless you're like super cool in the Bay Area and you know, you want to squeeze out that like nanosecond of performance because you know, you think that Docker is adding too much bullshit. Um, you really don't, it doesn't really matter, honestly. It, I think it's just a waste of time to, to think about it, right? At least for most companies, it's just a waste of time. Um, so that's what a virtual machine, that's how a virtual machine is different from a container, okay? So keep this in mind as we go through and we start talking about Kubernetes, right? All right, any questions about uh, this before we move on to the next topic, which is, how do we go from Docker to Kubernetes? Okay, all right. So once you have um, uh, that understanding of, of, of a container, this is what you have to know to kind of get with the program. So one, Docker is a, uh, is a way to define the container, but it's also a way to run the container, right? That's a Docker daemon, and we'll talk about that in a second. So a Docker file, I'm not going to go through that today. We're going to go through that in, in subsequent uh, uh, meetups. A Docker file is a, is a file that basically says, this is how you build an image. So from Linux, inherit everything that, because you can also start from scratch, for example. I'll show that in a second. But like from scratch, add this to make it a Linux kernel one, and then do all of this stuff to make it, uh, you know, uh, Nginx, and do all of this stuff and add WordPress to it, OK? And that image can be built and stored on that one local host, or it could be pushed to a registry, kind of like how you push an NPM package, right? And then when you run it, it runs as a container, right? So the image is what you build from a Docker file and the container is what is actually running. So by, when you write a Docker file, you've containerized it, but you're not really running it until you, you build the image and then you, you know, you host it on a host. Docker Compose comes with Docker generally, but it's, it's a different tool. And it used to be called Fig, but it basically can run multiple containers on a node or a host as a composition. Right? So why is this useful? <laughs> Why is this useful? Well, what if your application needs a database and a app server, like an API and a front end, right? So you can have three different Dockerized containers come up as a composition. If you didn't have Docker Compose, you'd be saying Docker run web server, Docker run database, Docker run uh, you know, front end web server, right? That's what you'd have to do. But with Docker Compose, you just define it in a YAML file and you say, run this, run this, run this. So all Docker Compose does is it wraps Docker run commands and makes it into code. And I'm super simplifying this, but Docker Swarm is a product from Docker that competed with Kubernetes and, and DCOS Mesosphere. They still kind of have it, but Docker Swarm, I don't know. I mean, I really like, I liked it, but more people just use these other, other tools. Docker Swarm, you could say, Here's my Docker Compose, scale it for me. And it would just magically do it for you. And Kubernetes does that. Kubernetes literally does that. And honestly, like um, it's very similar, but the syntax for Docker Compose is way simpler. So most of the time when you're learning and you're making applications, right? Most people just have to know this. 
because the hard part is here. Okay. But if you're curious, there's something called compose, which helps you translate a Docker compose into a Kubernetes uh, service definition. All right. Mesosphere, I'm mentioning it uh, for um, honorable mention. Um, you can literally go to Google and look for the trend. Like Mesos is what um, companies like, I think Facebook and Twitter, you know, they use Mesos to run massive applications in the cloud. Okay. And it basically takes a bunch of hardware and makes it into one machine for you. And you run a command and it basically figures out where to run it for you. It's different from the way Kubernetes does it. It's similar in the sense that you can run containers on top of that Mesos infrastructure. Um, so as Mesosphere, which is different than Mesos, which is the actual, uh, and, and it's also known as DCOS, uh, Data Center Operating System, as they matured, the company that supported it, Mesosphere became D2IQ, you can Google them, but basically now they're a Kubernetes company as well. And in fact, in the transition when Kubernetes was basically starting to eat their lunch, they were basically saying, oh, we can run Kubernetes on top of Mesosphere. We're better because of it. Like nobody gives a shit, honestly. Everybody became a Kubernetes company. So what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes today is like Linux. There are different distributions of it. You can get Kubernetes on Amazon. They manage it for you. You can get it on Azure. They manage it for you. Or you can download Rancher you can download uh, COPS. These are distributions of Kubernetes. So knowing Kubernetes, it's like this much, but then there's just from different distribution. So basically like I would say, you know, Rancher versus let's say uh, COPS would be like CentOS to Ubuntu. Whereas Linux is actually being developed by people all around the world that are using various distributions of Linux, right? The kernel, the Linux kernel is, then used by all of these distributions. So the, the Kubernetes project, there's a central Kubernetes project, and then there's all the, these different distributions of it. You can, by the way, if you download Docker and install it on Windows, at least, um, it actually can run Kubernetes called Minikube. It's like a miniature Kubernetes on your own computer, right? So you can run Kubernetes on your own computer and be cool. Um, but at the end of the day, this is how you get with the program. You don't have to know Mesosphere, honestly. Like, I don't want to cross it out. But essentially, if you know Docker, Docker Compose, and Kubernetes, you're, you're good to go. And the rest of this stuff is really for historical knowledge, so you don't look like a newbie. If people say, oh, have you heard of Docker Swarm? I'm like, yeah, but it's, I thought it was like useless nowadays. It's true. I'm like, oh, what about DCOS? I'm like, no, not really. Nobody uses that anymore, right? So that's what you have to know. now. Of that, let's go a little bit deeper. So what is an image? An image is basically a set of commands that have been run on top of the kernel. And each of these commands essentially changes the state of the image. So if you um, run, for example, um, this container, it'll download this, it'll download this, it'll download this, and it will start running your container, okay? But if you say, I also wanna run this container, it won't re-download the kernel because it already has it. It just downloads this and it'll download this. And what you can do with these uh, images is that you can inherit from, in fact, the Docker file says, from scratch, do this, do this, do this. Or you can say from Linux, or you can even say from Python. Where did those come from? Somebody made it. Somebody made the Python image for you to then inherit from and then add more to that image. Why is that useful? Well, if you use a image that already exists and you build on top of it, then if you have five applications, they all share a common ancestor in terms of the image. The first time you run one container, it'll have downloaded all of the parts of the image. The next time you run another app that kind of inherits from that same image, it doesn't need to re-download it. So that's another kind of uh, efficiency that we have uh, in containers where, you know, a part of app A and app B and app C, if they're the same, the Docker container only needs to have it once. 
And that's, that's a super optimization because you can literally have hundreds of containers that share one parent image and they can have half of them sharing another kind of a variation of that, right? And half that. So you, you basically optimize the storage and compute of a machine using containers. So scratch, you can take that and you can say, hey, from scratch, I'm gonna make the Alpine image. Alpine Linux is a very, very lightweight uh, Linux distribution that's just for containers. Like when you install Ubuntu on your computer, it comes with you know everything and the kitchen sink. But when you're hosting on the, on the cloud, like you don't really care, you just want Linux, right? So Alpine Linux is like a really, really slim down Linux. Then you can say from Alpine, I wanna make an Nginx image. You can say, this is how you make an Nginx image. What goes into that Docker file? Download Nginx <laughs> or, or install using apt-get or install using yum. And that command installs it. Now, what's the thing that makes it a, a runnable container? At the very end, you can say run Nginx given this configuration file. And how do we take this image and actually use it? We inject configurations into it. We either give them as environment variables um, in the Docker run command or in the Docker compose command or in Kubernetes, we give them as uh, configs in the service definition, right? Because this is immutable. You don't change these images, they're built. So what they do is they take environment variables and they run that code. So if you make Docker images locally and you build it and you push it to a registry, like a private registry or, or a public registry, that means whoever pulls down your code is going to have the same exact experience as somebody else. All around the world, they'll have the same exact experience. So packaging this is the biggest reason why people created Docker. The Docker guy even said, we wanted to make a Heroku clone that allowed people to do different languages. For, for those who have used Heroku on day one, it was only used for deploying Ruby on Rails applications. You would just push your code and it would, it would scale it for you. And then later when Docker came along, Heroku basically had to get with the program. And you know, now you, you can program in any major language and host it on Heroku. But that, that came because Docker came around and Docker provided a way for people to do the same thing. So anyways, we got Nginx. We can inherit from Nginx and say, make my WordPress container. And in, for the WordPress container, I need PHP and I need WordPress tarball to be unzipped here, okay? Um, and so what happens is you take that, that, um, you take that um, uh, image uh, file, the Docker file, you can build it with the Docker daemon. Uh, sorry, I don't know why this is cut off, but uh, it basically should be saying Docker build. And the Docker host and the client can be on the same machine. In fact, when you're doing local development, that's what's happening. And when you build it locally, it saves it to your local images. All right. Um, now, if you want to push it, you can say Docker push, and it will push it to a registry. And if there's a, uh, an image in the registry, you can say Docker pull. Um, you can't run a container unless A, you have built it locally, or you have pulled it. And I think, I don't, I don't know if I haven't, I haven't done this command stuff in a while, but like, unless you, I think you may, you may be able to just say Docker run, and it'll say, hey, well, I don't have this image. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download it for you. Right? So you make a Docker file if you need to. Otherwise, you can just say get the Redis image and run it. Get the Nginx image and run it. Get the CentOS or Ubuntu Linux image and just run it. You can do that because these are already on the public registry. If you go to dockerhub.com, there's like millions of, of containers, uh, image registry, uh, images on the image, image registry, uh, images in the image registry. And there's also an image registry for Kubernetes, but you can change registries. Um, you can make it a private one. You can use multiple you know, uh, registries if you want. But the idea of a registry is just like a repository of images, right? When you say like NPM install, right? That's kind of like Docker pull. Get this image for me. Or like, you know, pip install. It's basically doing that. It's kind of getting the image for you and then you run it. Are any questions about Docker basics? Okay. Um, 
as I said, this, this is an overview. I don't expect people to like walk away being Docker and Kubernetes ninjas today, but it's going to build on the, the, the subsequent sessions on, on this that are going to build on this. So uh, just remember this. And if you're watching this at a later time, um, we will cover more. Okay. Um, all right. So we talked about Docker. We talked about Docker Compose. What is a container? You know, how do you run it? Um, let's talk a little bit about Kubernetes. This is the general architecture of Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, we have nodes. Nodes are physical nodes. To run Kubernetes, generally you need a minimum of three physical nodes. Okay, But you can also run it on just one computer if you really want. You need at least one master node. You have multiple, right? And that's called a control plane. A control plane is basically the set of master nodes. We'll talk about the control plane in a second. And we have worker nodes. You probably have at least two. Why? Because well, if one goes down, then you know you have another one. So what is a master node? The master node controls and manages a set of worker nodes which is where the workloads are running. We'll talk about workloads, right? All communication to the cluster is via the API server, which is on the master node or the control plane. The kube control manager, which runs a set of controllers for the running cluster. So um, control plane, right? This is the control plane. Um, it's running an API, it's running a schedule, it's running etcd, which is where it stores um, you know, the configuration, everything that the API is reading and writing to is basically being stored in etcd. And etcd is a raft implementation that can store configuration uh, basically on, on, it's like a file system, but it's more than a file system. It's a key value store that is distributed, right? So um, it, this is the reason um, why, um, uh, you know, you can have a high availability control plane because this etcd is then replicated to all of the other nodes. Okay, um, and so when you talk to the control plane, you make a change to this configuration, the nodes then pick up from that uh, configuration or their pushed uh, changes and the nodes then start doing work for you. So no one should really be SSHing into the nodes, into the worker nodes, like never. And no one really needs to go SSH into the control plane, like basically never. Because you can install the kubectl, the client, right? You can install it on your computer and just connect to the control plane via API. Um, the GUIs like, uh, that are out there, you know, the web GUIs that are out there, they talk to Kubernetes basically via API calls, right? So masternode has all the shit that runs Kubernetes and stores the config, uh, and workers are do that, the ones that do the work. You can have like three master nodes and you can have 20 worker nodes. All right. So what is a worker node? It runs the workloads, All right? Um, so basically, you know, the worker nodes has kubelet, kubeproxy, and both of those connects the pods within the containers, within the, within the Docker. Like in here, it works uh, with your containers. It takes information from the API, right? From the, the master node. Right, and make sure that those pods are running. All right, so if you make a change to the state here, it will then start running those things. So Kubernetes at, at the core is a, is a state machine. When you say, this is what I want running, the worker nodes then try to become consistent with that idea of your world. So if you say, I want five of these things running, it will run five of those things for you on the worker nodes. If you say, I want to scale it down to two, it'll run two of those for you. So these workers are basically going to the master control plane and saying, what do I need to do? Do I need to change anything? Do I need to change anything? If not, it just continues doing what was there before. So everything we do as uh, you know, Kubernetes code, quote unquote, services, uh, uh, definitions, or if you do uh, Helm charts, all of these things, ultimately, they just change the state of Kubernetes on the control plane, ultimately back down to etcd. And the workers talk to the control plane and they say, OK, I need to do this. Um, Terraform is similar to this, but it's done slightly differently. 
In Terraform, you say, this is my state. And then you say plan and it tells you what's going to be different. And then you say Terraform apply and it goes, makes things for you. Well, in, in Kubernetes, you basically say, apply this change. And if it sees a difference, it goes ahead and does it. All right, and we're not going to do command line Kubernetes today. I'm just talking through the concepts here. All right. In a physical node, we have kubelets that are talking to uh, kubelet, which is talking to the master, master control plane here. And in this case, we can use Docker as the runtime. We don't have to. There are other runtimes that can run containers that are compatible with OCI, including Docker, including RKT, right? So this is where Docker comes into Kubernetes. Docker is used to run the containers. You're not going to be running Docker build here. Right? You do Docker build locally, and you push it to a registry. But the Kubernetes nodes, they go to the registry, and they bring it down. All right. But inside a node, we don't just put containers. We put something called pods. And a pod is basically a collection of nodes. I'm sorry, a collection of pods, a uh, uh, collection of containers, and a collection of volumes. You can have one container, which is stateless, or you can have um, a, a container here with like two containers that are stateless, and then you can have a volume. A volume is basically where you put information that needs to keep state, right? And a pod, uh, I'll get to in a second, um, is basically the, the lowest unit of work that you can have in Kubernetes. You cannot just say run WordPress on Kubernetes. You have to make a pod for that, that has MySQL and it has WordPress. A pod is uh, similar to a compose, yeah. Technically, you could take a composition and make a pod out of it, absolutely. That would be one, one way to think about it. It's like a composition, yeah. And, it, and the thing is that if we have to run this pod on another node, it will make sure that all of these are also running on the other node. Right, it's not going to run half of it. So, let's say let's say the WordPress example, right? More than likely, we would run a MySQL pod as a stateful set because it has it has information, right? And then we would have a WordPress pod because you maybe only need two running in, you know instances of MySQL, but you can have fifty instances of WordPress. That makes sense, JB. Yep. So containers by themselves, they don't know much in Kubernetes, but they, you need to make it part of a pod. Um, these are different types of pods. They're just kind of illustrating that you can have a very simple pod. You can have a complex pod. Uh, as I was saying earlier, most smallest, most basic uh, deployable objects in Kubernetes represents a single instance of a running process in your cluster. Pod contains one or more containers. So such as Docker containers, and that's an example. Most people these days, they just use a Docker, Docker built, Docker container, Docker runtime. Uh, when a pod runs multiple containers, the containers are managed as a single entity and they share the pod's resources. Same picture again, just to bring back the idea that what a pod is. Now, I'm gonna pause for a second before we go to the rest of it. Um, what are your questions? Any questions beyond this or up to this, excuse me? All right, continuing forward. So workloads are basically, yeah, go ahead. Question? Uh, yeah. Uh, will there be any interaction between the pos uh, possible interaction between the pods? Oh yeah, all the time, right? You bring up a pod from MySQL, you expose the MySQL service. Right, you 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 have a WordPress pod that then talks to that MySQL service. Anything additional is required to be done, or just um, running the pod will be sufficient. Well, there are uh, what we call uh, ingress and load balancers, and we'll talk about that uh, in in a second. But basically, um, when you create a service, um, you 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 expose it in a certain way, and different services are exposed in different ways. Right, and then the pods can talk to each other if they're exposed. 
But like, if you have something in here that's never exposed, then it's not going to be, it's like, it's like a composition, right? If you don't expose the part, nobody can talk to it. Okay, okay, I got it, got it. Oh. But the reason it's not as simple as a composition is like, oh, just make this port available is that you can have this pod. If you have 10, 10 nodes and you have 10 instances of this pod running, right? How do you quote expose it? Well, you have to have a load balancer, right? Yeah. Right, so that's why it gets a little bit more complex, but we'll, we'll get to that. We'll eventually get to that, but good question. All right. Um, so. At the core, you can take a pod and you can do what's called a deployment. A deployment is basically a change to Kubernetes to say, run this thing for me. And you can make a deployment run with many, many replicas, and that's called a replica set. These are were uh, probably the first types of workloads that people started running on Kubernetes, which are stateless, meaning I have an express app or a Flask app or a Java, you know, Spring Boot app, right? That I want running and it doesn't have any state except for maybe the configuration to go talk to a particular database server. And people actually had external database servers. They did not, people did not run databases on containers. All right, this is a fairly new thing. Stateful sets are only like a year or so old, okay? Um, generally speaking, if you had asked me up until February of this year, should I run Cassandra on Kubernetes? I would have been like, um, are you a Kubernetes rockstar and a Cassandra rockstar? And if either of those was no, I'd be like, sorry, don't do it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of like, you'd have to have a lot of knowledge to be able to do that. Nowadays, there are toolings that help us do it better. And so we're, we're just talking about the toolings right now. We're not even going into how to do it right now. Okay, so a deployment is basically a stateless application. You can and you can scale it with something called a replica set. Then we have something called a stateful set. A stateful set leverages something called a persistent volume, and you can have claims to that persistent volume. Persistent volumes is an abstract term because if you're on AWS, your persistent volume could be backed by EBS. If you're on Azure, it could be backed by Blob storage. If you're on Google, it could be backed by whatever Google's is. If you're doing it on your own hardware, it could be backed by your NVMe disk. Right? So it's, it's an abstraction. But once you have some state, like basically you're saying, for this stateful set on this particular hardware, I want to claim this area of the node's disk for this stateful set. So that means if a pod comes up and it needs that data, it's right there, right? This pod particularly is not, not gonna come up on a node that does not have its data. That's why you have to think about stateful set. If it was stateless, that doesn't matter where this thing runs. It could run anywhere on any node. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have any inherent disk data. It can talk to a database, but a database has to have disk data. I mean, where else is it gonna keep it? Right? So that's why stateful sets were created. It was a way for a service to run and have a place to call its own for its data. So the next time that pod came up after a failure, it knew where the data was. Any questions? That's what we are saying, right? As a part of the pod, it will uh, can uh, have a volume as well, right? But but these are if these these volumes are not guaranteed. This is by, by the way. This is also a pod, right? I'm not saying this is not a pod, right? Yeah, this will be a pod with the volumes, right? Right, right. But they're called stateful sets for a different for because they're using persistent volumes. You can have volumes on on pods that are not managed by persistent volume. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, okay, fine. Like you can have a volume that's backed by S3 that's available everywhere. That's different, right? It's not local to this machine. It's globally available. Yeah, agreed, yeah. It's like the spaces on DigitalOcean. Remember, you had to bring that yeah. up. From, it's different, right? So spaces are different. Um, so, but on this, you can run more than MySQL. You can run Cassandra. And, and honestly, up until 
uh, this, you could run MySQL as long as you are running one node of MySQL and you are replicating it. And uh, even if you're replicating it with MySQL, you replicate all of the data, right? But with Cassandra, we have the data uh, partitioned uh, into different uh, token ranges. And so a pod that's running on this node has to have affinity to a particular area or disk of that machine. So we need to basically create these persistent volumes and assign them to pods. Um, daemon set is basically to run some service that runs on the node, okay? And it's, it's again, it's, it's a pod, but it's something that runs maybe once or twice or whatever, but it's running on, the, on this machine. It doesn't really expose anything. It just runs as a service to help with other stuff. So you can have like a service that says, hey, is this thing up? Is this thing up? If it's not, restart it. Although basically Kubernetes is doing that for you, right? But you can have a service that monitors. So like a Prometheus collector, right? You would put in a daemon set that collects data from Cassandra and then sends it to Grafana somewhere or sends it to Prometheus uh, somewhere, right? And then finally, we have something called a job or a cron job, which, you know, when, when we work in data, we're running some task to do some extraction, do some you know translation, do some load, that's a job. And it can be one time or it can be as a recurring cron job. All right, so this is Kubernetes right here. Master node, worker node. Master node has a control plane, which has an API server that stores configs. Worker nodes take information from the master node via API, and it becomes consistent to what is planned inside the control plane. The worker nodes run pods. Pods are collections of containers and volumes. There are different types of pods, deployments, stateful sets, daemon sets, and jobs. Deployments are stateless. Stateful state sets have state local to the disk on that particular machine or some other type of volume that you assign to it. Daemon sets are basically uh, services that run as potentially as sidecars and jobs run and then go away, right? All of these things keep running. Uh, sorry, uh, somebody unmuted. Do you have a question or a comment? Okay, all right. Um, and so in five minutes, I'm going to explain Helm uh, and, and <laughs> operators. Now, we'll, we'll come back and we'll review this next time. But this, you can do everything inside Kubernetes up until this point. So why are these other technologies available to make it easier? Well, generally speaking, uh, there was a technology uh, uh, that is now part of uh, Kubernetes called the operator pattern. All right. Operators are basically um, in code a way to uh, automate things that are being done, right? And you just configure it. And it's like a it's like a robot, right? So all the things that you're doing here, you could say, deploy a particular application on demand when somebody's looking for it. Take a back backup or you know restore a backup. Do updates, changes to the schema. Right, um, but it, it goes beyond that. It could be used to do complex things like Cassandra deployments or Kafka deployments, because if you're doing it on your own, you literally have to build out each of these pods and make it connect and do all of the stuff, right? But if you have an operator that kind of gives you a facade where you say, do this, do this, do this and do this, and it does all the hard work for you, it makes your job easier. So an operator is, there are operators in, in uh, uh, you know, Kubernetes, uh, people build it in different ways, but there's a thing called operator SDK. And you can build an operator S SDK either using Helm itself, which I'll talk about in a second, via Go, which is a programming language. Um, I also believe in Java. Um, or Ansible. You can write an operator in Ansible. If you're familiar with Ansible with Terraform, you can do it here as well. I love Ansible. So we'll cover the operator uh, again next week. Well, what is Helm? Helm is basically 
kind of wrapping a lot of the stuff that we do with Kubernetes and um, with operators. And it wraps it in a very easy to use um, kind of configuration mechanism, right? So you have, you have on your computer where you have kubectl running to make changes to Kubernetes, you would, you would install Helm. And then on the cluster, we run a tiller that the, the Helm client talks to. And, and what does it do? It deploys a chart of services or operators. And you can make a change to the chart and then you can say, is this, released, is this release applied or not, right? So it's then using this idea of releases on top of the Kubernetes state machine. And then a repository is where you keep different charts, kind of like a registry, but for charts. Um, makes it easier to do complex things like this. Re re reduces duplication because if you make a, a Helm chart for let's say MariaDB, then many, many different people can use that Helm chart. It can manage things that we didn't talk about it today, but it can manage things like the configuration and, and the secrets related to running an application, which you have to do if you're running an application. Um, makes deployments easier. You can, you can run a Helm chart locally. You can run a Helm chart in production. Same exact Helm chart. So here's one for, let's say, WordPress. MariaDB, WordPress, Nginx. This is one for Jupyter Lab, right? So between Helm charts and operators, here's an operator for Kafka, right? Pods, okay? Um, some daemons, Prometheus and Grafana, which are also pods. Uh, here's Spark on Kubernetes with an operator. And finally, here's Cassandra operator, right? So on, on a cluster's worker node, this is not the master node, we would be running the operator as a pod. And then on different machines, we can create a stateful set for a particular rack because a rack is the lowest common denominator in terms of actual stored data that needs to be consistent. Right? So you can have a rack, and this thing can be a data center across six machines. That's a high availability Cassandra cluster. That's all I have for today. To be continued, um, as you can imagine, we, we covered basically a 1,000 years uh, in about a, not even an hour, maybe 45 minutes. When I say 1,000 years, like we covered from basically 2014 2013 up until now, which is not a long time, right? Cassandra has been around for like 11 years. Docker Kubernetes has been around for our six, seven years, right? Um, there's a saying, it's like Kubernetes complicating shit since 2014, right? It takes this cool aspect of Docker and like really, really complicates it. But Helm and operators make it a little bit easier. So I have some uh, links that I'm going to uh, get posted on the Anant blog uh, with, this, with basically the same content. Um, and this video will be posted online. Um, don't forget to subscribe to our um, mailing list, our YouTube channel, and um, go to our Cassandra link if you're looking for new, fresh news about Cassandra. Um, sorry, we don't have any time to do Q&A today. I wanna to respect everybody's time to go and get to the rest of their work day. So thanks everybody for joining. We'll see you next time, same, same place, uh, same time, um, 12 Eastern Daylight Savings Time, 12 p.m. and, and 11 uh, a.m. Uh, Daylight Savings Time, Central Time. Take care, guys. Thanks all, take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.